Welcome to Emergency First. We're so glad you're here. Thanks for watching this week's message. If you would like more information about Marenzi First, such as service times or ministry opportunities, feel free to check out facebook.com backslash Marenzi AG or Marenzi First at youtube.com. And two great ways to stay connected throughout the week is by hitting the subscribe button on our YouTube page. That way you'll be notified when something new is posted and by hitting like on our Facebook page. Thanks again for joining us today. Welcome home. Chapter 1, we're going to start with verse number 2. Today's the last message of the Erased series. I've so enjoyed this. This has been such a powerful series. We've had so many people filled with the Holy Spirit through this. And, and uh, those refill, we have some healing. I mean, gosh, it's been moving. And, uh, but it's not stopping just because the series is ending. We're going to keep on pressing in. But uh, I tell you what, God has more for us to learn. So we're going to step to our next series but today we're going to talk about, all right, have it your way. And uh, I tell you, it's, it's kind of comical. I, I'm not going to, well, I will tell you how I got the title of this message. Uh, one of my favorite shows, I probably shouldn't confess this, but I'm going to say it anyway. I love the old 80s A-Team. I'm a kid of the 80s. I love the old 80s A-Team. And I... I, I have to, you know, it's the dad's duty to pass on legacy to your children. So I have been forcing my daughters to learn what the A-Team is all about. So we have been watching some of these. Actually, we've been watching a lot of these lately because, you know, Emily's getting ready to grow up and she thinks she's going to move out one day. We'll see if that happens or not because we might not let her go. But, but she thinks so. So I have to make sure she learns some of the important stuff of life, you know. Anyway, there's this scene in the A-Team where, where Hannibal's coming up with the plan. Everybody know the A-Team, you know, Hannibal, VA, all that kind of stuff. Hannibal's coming up with the plan, and uh, he said, we're going to do it this way. And, and they're like, why? And he says, because the best defense is a great offense. And B.A. says, that's not right. He says, no, the best offense is the best defense. And Hannibal's like, all right, have it your way. So... It stuck out to me, so that's what we're going to talk about today. All right, have it your way. But the best defense is the best offense. And we're going to talk about the Christian's offense and, and how to stand up and pick up our sword and what God is calling us to do. I believe that God wants us to begin to rebuild some things. He's wanting us to begin to understand that this life is more than just going to work and coming home. He wants us to be about his business. There's a lot for us to do. I don't know about you, but I know that Jesus is coming soon. Anybody believe that? And I, I don't want to be caught idle. I, I want to be about the Father's business. So let's look at Nehemiah 1, verse number 2. All right, here we go. And I asked them concerning the Jews who escaped, who survived the exile, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, the remnant there is, the remnant there in the province who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and the gates are destroyed by fire. As soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days, and I continued fasting and praying before God of heaven. And I said, O oh Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments, let your ear be attentive to your eyes and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant that I now pray before you day and night. For the people of Israel, your servants, confessing sins of people of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Even I and my father's house have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments and the statutes and the rules that you have commanded your servant Moses. Doesn't that sound like our land today? Remember the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though you are dispersed, 
Be it under the farthest skies, I will gather them from there and bring them back to this place that I have chosen to make my name dwell there. They are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your people and your servants who delight to fear your name and give success to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of all men. Dolores. Nehemiah, del 1, 1, del 2 al 11. Que vino Hananí, uno de mis hermanos, con algunos varones de Judá, y les pregunté por los judíos que habían escapado, que habían quedado de la cautividad, y por Jerusalén. Y me dijeron, el remanente, los que quedaron de la cautividad, allí en la provincia, están en gran mal y afrenta, y el muro de Jerusalén derribado, y sus puertas quemadas a fuego. Cuando oí estas palabras, me senté y lloré, e hice duelo por algunos días, y ayuné y oré delante del Dios de los cielos. Y dije, te ruego, oh Jehová, Dios de los cielos, fuerte, grande y temible, que guarda el pacto y la misericordia a los que le aman y guardan sus mandamientos. Esté ahora atento tu oído y abierto tus ojos para oír la oración de tu siervo, que haga ahora delante de ti, Día y noche, por los hijos de Israel, tus siervos, y confieso los pecados de los hijos de Israel que hemos cometido contra ti. Sí, yo y la casa de mi padre hemos pecado. En extremo nos hemos corrompido contra ti. Y nos hemos guardado los mandamientos, y no hemos guardado los mandamientos, estatutos y preceptos que diste a Moisés, tu siervo. Acuérdate ahora de la palabra que diste a Moisés, tu siervo, diciendo, Si vosotros pecareis, yo os dispersaré por los pueblos. Pero si os volveréis a mí, y guardaréis mis mandamientos, y los pusiereis por obra, aunque vuestra dispersión fuera hasta el extremo de los cielos, de allí os recogeré, y os traeré al lugar que escogí para hacer habitar allí mi nombre. Ellos, pues... Son tus siervos y tu pueblo, los cuales redimiste con tu gran poder y con tu mano poderosa. Te ruego, oh Jehová, esté ahora atento tu oído a la oración de tu siervo y a la oración de tus siervos. Quienes desean reverenciar tu nombre, concede ahora buen éxito a tu siervo y dale gracia delante de aquel varón, porque yo servía de, cope, de copero al rey. Amen. Amen. Father, I ask your blessing upon your word. Just meet us right where we are. Lord, I pray that you plant this word so deep in our heart that, Lord, that we always look to you. Lord, let us rebuild what is being broken down. Lord, let us get in anguish. Lord, I pray right now that we begin to understand what you're calling us to do. Lord, let us preach as one who has authority with the demonstration of power. Let your signs and wonders follow our ministry all the days of our life. In your precious holy name we pray. And all God's people say, amen, amen. I, I've never felt so connected. I told you a couple of weeks ago, kind of touched on some of this, but, but I have to confess, I've never felt so connected with Nehemiah as I do right now. I, I feel so broken in my spirit over things that are happening, things that we see happening. Every day there's a new news story coming out of a new commercial or a new television show or something aimed at our children to destroy the next generation or, or something to destroy the family or, or to take out faith. or it, it just feels like there's an attack coming from every area and every direction. And, and no matter how much you move forward, it always feels like you take one step forward and you take 12 steps back. And you're spending your entire life just trying to get enough air to breathe. Feels like sometimes the, the entire world is upon your back and upon your shoulders. And, and I tell you, I just feel sometimes so broken in my spirit about what's happening, not only in our world, but what's happening in our own families, in our communities, and, and just what's happening around us. And, and I just have this burning thought inside of me that the church was put here 
to begin to remove the strongholds of the enemy over people's lives. I really believe that the church is here to begin to speak light into what is dark. We're supposed to speak life into what is dead. We're supposed to begin to be salt into this darkness. But there's something that has happened. We've lost connection with the Holy Spirit. And there's so many casualties to it. You know, that there are so many people in our world right now that are facing fear and, and doubt and worry. You'd be so amazed at how many people are dealing with oppression and depression and all the other stuff. And, you know, depression is a hard thing to deal with. It's sad. It's one of the worst. Uh, in my opinion, it, it is one of the worst diseases out there because it, it just feels hopeless. It's so broken. And then when it comes to people of the spirit, people that know Jesus, people of the church, it seems like we know everyone's voice. You know, we know fear's voice. We know anxiety's voice. We, we know death's voice. We know the world's voice. We know fear's voice. But we have a hard time knowing the spirit's voice. It's so foreign to us. We know every voice except the Holy Spirit's. And, and we're, we're kind of, we're longing for something to begin to change. And then we begin to read the Nehemiah story. And, and he, Nehemiah, he, he heard about the walls that were broken and the walls that were torn down and on fire back in Jerusalem. And something hit him and said, you know what? That's my country. Those are my people. That's my family. That's my country. That, that's, that's me. I've got to do something. There's something that hit him and said you know what I can't sit still any longer I can't put it on the back burner I can't say that someone else's job there was something inside of him that said you know what if I don't do it maybe no one else will and he began to be anguished and he began to cry out to God and he began to say God you know what the walls are burning around me everything's falling apart and somebody's got to stand up Lord and if no one else will I will and he begins to feel this inner burning in this cry that begins to force him to know hey these walls have to be rebuilt something has to be done something has to be said something has to be accomplished and the church has to rise up and I, I just I have this thought inside of myself where are the modern day Nehemiahs that are looking around saying to everybody else look the walls around me are on fire my country is on fire the church is on fire my family's on fire and things are all around me burning down Somebody's got to step up and say hey wait a minute if you can't send anyone else you can send me Everybody's so quiet. I know we have a smaller crowd today, so you can just say to the empty chair, he's talking to you. It'll make you feel better. This sermon was prepared for him, and they just didn't show up. But no, I, I just, I have this thought inside of myself. You know, the, the church is called to be salt and light. The church is called to reach to the darkness. And I see so many casualties left on this spiritual battlefield that are struggling with all of this stuff. And there's nobody running back and rescuing. There's nobody reaching a hand out. There's nobody saying, okay, the walls are burning. It's time to do something about it. It's time to sound the alarm. It's time to say, hey, wait a minute. There are things that aren't right. There are things that need to be done. There are things that have to stop. And there's nobody stepping up and saying, you know what? Wait a minute. That's me. I'm going to step up. I'm going to make a change. I'm going to let God use me because I, I believe our society right now, it's crumbling around us. Haven't you noticed? The wall of morality is going away. Man, I, I remember growing up, my grandparents, they lived in Missouri. They never locked their front door, back door, any door. You come and go as you please. My God, I don't step out of my car by two feet without locking that door. My wife, she click, 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 like 27 times before she gets out. 
I would never leave the door unlocked. It's amazing. We, we live in a different culture. And what can we blame it on? Oh, wait a minute. Uh, it, do we have more people now? Is, is that the problem? I don't think so. Are, are people different? Are people now aliens and they were people before? That, no. What, what has happened? There, there's been this degradation, you know, this, this stopping of moral integrity. There, there's been this downplay of what is right. There's been this decay of our moral fiber. And no one is standing up in the midst of it and saying, hey, wait a minute. We're getting off track a little bit this way. And if we don't stop and we don't get back on course, we're going to eventually run off the rails. And we begin to just take it as it comes. You know, I told you a couple of weeks ago, I think the body of Christ has begun to, you know, swallow what the world is, is feeding us. You know, we're, we're straining out camels and we're swallowing gnats or straining out gnats and swallowing camels. However, you know, we, we've really forgotten that heaven is real and hell is forever. Let me say that again. I, I think the church has really forgotten that heaven is real and hell is forever. And we're not promised tomorrow. And, and death is all around us. And here's the truth. You may live 80, 90, even 100 years. But what's 100 years to your eternity? Your 100 years really doesn't matter in the end when you base it towards your eternity. Your 100 years is a blink of an eye if you even get 100 years. But our society will tell us, hey, you, you do everything within your own power to live the way that you want to, the way that you feel right, and all about you. But the bottom line is, is we're living for the wrong world. Because instead of living for eternity, instead of living for what is real, we're living for our 80 years. And the bottom line is that our 80 years will come and go. But God didn't ask our opinion when he set the rules. And he's not going to ask our opinion when he judges us by the rules. Ooh, that's good. God didn't ask our opinion when he set the rules. And he's not going to ask our opinion when he judges us by the rules. It's the set of standard. There is a right and wrong. There is a truth. So you know what, I, I, I'm just here to tell us today that it's time to begin to build something. It's time to re begin to rebuild the walls. It's time to understand that God is coming again. It's time to understand that the best defense is a great offense. You know, it's time to take back what the enemy is stealing from us. You know, the enemy will take whatever we're not protecting. And I'm really getting tired of him messing with our families. I'm really getting tired of him messing with our church family. I'm really getting tired of him messing with our community. I'm really getting tired of him messing with our country. And I'm really getting tired of him taking a lot of land from us and a lot of places from us. And we're not doing anything about it. I'm here to tell you it's time for us to take up the sword. It's time for us to begin to fight back and tell the enemy you have no more right to steal my family. You have no more right to send my kids to hell. You have no more right to addict my family to drugs. You have no more right. We're going to fight back. We are one nation under God. And we will defend that. Now look, I'm not calling for a militia to stand up with guns and an army. But I am calling spirit-filled believers to know when to stand up and when to sit down, when to speak and when to be quiet. I'm calling us to be spirit-led people to know how to be active and how to stand up. There's times to speak and there's times to be quiet. There's times to stand up and there's times to sit down. But I'm here to tell you, church, it's time that we begin to do something. And how do we do it? We're spirit-led. We say, wherever you want me to go, whatever you want me to do, Lord, there will I go. There will I go, because time is running out. So I want to look at a couple of things that the, that the Lord has dropped in my heart about rebuilding the walls. Some things I feel like we're supposed to rebuild walls about. So if you're taking notes with me, let's jump right into this. Number one, 
The wall of fundamentals. And I, I know that's a crazy word. Might even scare you to death. The walls of fundamentals. You know, in, in the recent past, things like doctrine and Bible reading and praying and all that kind of stuff have become so trite and, and so passed over and people just begin to look at it as old time traditions and all the other stuff. But here's the deal. How can you stand for something if you don't know what you're standing for? And how can you stand for something you don't know what you believe? How can you stand for your beliefs if you don't know what you believe? We have so many Christians and so many believers that do not know what they believe. We have so many confessing Bible-believing believers that do not know what the Bible says. And we're supposed to be standing on something that we don't understand or know that we don't know. How can you stand for what you're not understanding or not stand for what you don't know? I know that every time somebody mentions the word doctrine, everybody thinks about this craziness. And, 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 but you know what? I, I really believe that we should know what we believe. We should know who we are. You should know what God's word says. You should know what God says about certain things. Why? Because I believe the greatest way that the enemy has stolen our culture is because he's manipulated our feelings and us, instead of making judgments and decisions out of biblical-based fact, we've made it out of emotionally-based feelings. We've not made decisions based upon the word of God. We've based it upon the manipulation of the world. We've not known what God has said about certain issues. You know, it's a shame. We need to know what God is saying about things. We need to know what he says about current issues. We need to know what he's saying. We have to begin to be people of prayer. And I know that's the other one, and I know we talk about prayer quite often. And I know, I know, I know, I know it's all, there are people watching online, and maybe even you, you think, man, that's archaic. You'd rather hear a sermon about 21 ways that to get Mr. Wright or Mrs. Wright to fall through your ceiling and propose to you. <laughs> that's what we're all about, and I get it. And I know it's archaic to sit here and go back to the basics and talk about Bible reading and prayer and all that kind of jazz. But can I tell you and just be really, really truthful and honest with you? I would be really, really, really suspicious about that guy that falls through your roof because he's probably not from God. Because let me tell you the truth. Mr. Wright will be a praying man. So if you're not a praying woman, God's not going to send Mr. Wright a praying man to you because you're Mrs. Wrong. And vice versa. Bottom line is, is we must begin to be about Knowing what God says and spending time with the Lord. And look, I know sometimes it's tough and, and I know that sometimes we don't really know, but you got to start. When you begin to spend time with the Lord and he begins to love upon you, you'll desire time with him. There's something special about coming to the altar. One, one of the most vivid memories I've ever had in my life, it, it just shocked me to the core and just broke my heart. I was at a, a preaching conference and the preacher was preaching and he got up and he said, he said, you know, prayer is kind of like cleaning the toilets. No one wants to do it, but you have to. And I thought, how could you compare sitting at the feet of the king of glory and being coming intoxicated with the one that created my innermost being, the one that loves me more than I can love myself, the, where I fall in love with my creator over and over and over again. How can you compare that to cleaning toilets? 
But, you know, we kind of have that mentality because we kind of think about it, you know, as it's my time, my way, my time. But the bottom line is, is once you get started and you have a connection and you have an experience with Jesus, you're not going to want to stop. It's going to change who you are. Number two, the wall of moral integrity. You know, our world is so cynical. They really believe that every man has its price. I'm so sick and so tired of every movie trying to prove the principle that every man has its price. You know, the question really isn't what the sin looked like to you. The question is, is what the sin looked like to a holy God. It's really not what the sin looked like to a person in Hollyweird or, or a person in a, you know, a, any other thing. It really doesn't matter what the news media thinks sin looks like. It really doesn't matter what the anything says. But what does sin really look like to Jesus? What does sin really look like to Jesus? You know, the church needs to rebuild the wall of integrity. We need to stop selling out. And, and I know deep down inside of ourselves, we're like, well, you know what? How can you say that? We would never sell out. We would never do that. But let's really be flat out honest. How many times do we cave and give in because we really don't want to stand against the pressure? Or do we do things we don't even want to do because we go with the flow instead of against the flow? We give in all the time. How many times do you feel so guilty about the things that you do because you know it's not right? We're constantly breaking down our integrity and giving in to our world around us. And we carry that weight. We carry that guilt. First of all, Jesus forgives and he wants us to walk more humbly before him. But I'm here to tell you, we need to start walking with integrity because we need to start living within heaven in mind. Because as we said two minutes ago, you can live for the 80 years or you can live for eternity. And we must start living for eternity. You know, this is why, you, let's just be honest, this is why the church has as many divorces as the world has. We have to be so careful. When it comes to our children, when it comes to our teenagers, when it comes to life in general, we have to be so careful that the Bible and the Holy Spirit inside of us and the spirit conscience actually sets the rules, not the world around us. Because, you know, I, I really... And, and listen to me, I do not believe, and we had a problem years and years ago where sometimes parents inside the church were stuffed-necked and very, very tight. There, were, there are some things just called being kids. But what really burns the tar out of me is when a teenager is in the need of correction and their parents are like, well, they're just normal teenagers. Well, I'm here to tell you there's also something called just being a normal parent. You know, that there's something called just being a normal parent. And parents have to sometimes say no. Look, I'm not calling us to be stuff-necked. And, and, you know, look, there are some things that just normal kids. But there are also things that is biblically wrong that we can't just pass off as the world does. Well, that's just teenage behavior. Because you know what the teenage behavior of the world is all the time telling us? You know, oh, you know, it, it's normal. This is normal and that's normal. Well, it's not normal. You know what the world tells us is normal? They're, they're like, you know, if your teenager has premarital sex, they can just have an abortion on demand. That's normal. And if they get an STD, they can just have a commercial or they can stand in front of the world and say, you know what? I haven't had a breakout in a month. Look at me. Ha, ha, ha. That's pretty gross. That we've fallen so far as a society that we parade teenagers across the TV proclaiming that they haven't had breakouts in a month. We need a wall of integrity. 
It's not normal morality. Normal morality is what God says. Who made this world the judge of what is right and what is wrong? Who said this world will tell us what is right, what is wrong, what is good? As we said a second ago, you know, God didn't ask our opinion when he created the rules. And he's not going to ask us our opinion when he judges by the rules. God set the standards. He's the judge of what is normal. And our world is corrupting it. Number three, the wall of accountability. You know, Romans 2.16 talks about, Paul wrote of the day when God would judge the inner secrets of the heart. And he wasn't trying to shame anybody. And he wasn't trying to scare anybody. But what he was trying to say is this, look, if you had the image, if Jesus actually appeared in your bedroom, you might act differently. If you, everywhere you walked, if Jesus was literally walking beside you in physical form, you may think twice about what you're doing. But then Paul goes on to say, you know, you may not actually see him standing beside you in physical form, but because he's spirit actually makes it more dangerous. That means that he's everywhere. He sees what you're doing in secret. So what you think you're getting away from, he's actually taking note of so he's actually seeing all those things so paul is saying hey wait a minute you think you're escaping but you're not god is actually taking note if he was to appear to you in physical form you may think about it but the fact that he is spirit around you you pay no attention but paul says hey wait a minute wake up the fact that he is spirit means that he's everywhere that's more dangerous This accountability to realize I, I am accountable to God. I am accountable to other people. I am accountable to the way that I live. I'm accountable to my family. And we need to get that deep down inside of ourselves. There, there is nothing wrong with accountability. There's nothing wrong with that. We need to wear the accountability. Look, if you're a married man, there's an accountability to your spouse, the way that you talk to other women, the way that you flirt with somebody or not flirt with somebody. Look, if you're a married man, there's an accountability there. You don't have the right to do what a non-married man has the right to do. Whether your wife is around you or not, there's an accountability that goes with that. If you're a father or a mother and you have children at home, that raises the roof of your accountability. You're no longer the running around teenager. Now you're an parent. You have to act like an adult because what you do flows down to them. How you behave rubs off not only on their behavior, but also affects them. There's accountability. There's nothing wrong with accountability. There's nothing wrong with realizing, hey, wait a minute, I'm accountable to God. I'm accountable to my spouse. I'm actually even accountable to my children. Think about that. Our children are accountable to us and we're accountable to them. Accountable to God. How we think about liberty and sin. Realizing that we are accountable. And then number three, the sacredness of family. Or number four, you know, there's a breakdown, a, a wall. You know, we read about in John 2, 1, Jesus being invited to a marriage. And, and it's a beautiful thing. But Jesus needs to not just be invited to the marriage. He needs to be invited to the home. Because the breakdown of every civilization starts in the home. And the rebuilding of every civilization starts in the home. If we want to see fixing or we want to see our civilization fixed, we got to start in the home. There has to be a sacredness to our homes. There's a sacredness to family. There's a sacredness to marriage. There's a sacredness to life. 
how we treat one another, how we love one another, how we treat our neighbor, whether you know somebody or not, if they're breathing live humans, there's a way that goes about how you treat them. A couple years ago, I mean, not a couple years ago, a couple months ago, I preached on the decorums of life and, and it fits here. Look, there's a decorum, a way that we treat one another. There's just the way that we treat somebody. But there's a sacredness to family. Sacredness to marriage. It still is. Till death do us part. And, and I know that that's, that's tough because, you know, Satan wants to destroy our homes. And we have to rebuild the wall around our families. I, I think right now the family is under an attack. Our children are under an attack. And men and women of God better start covering their children with prayer and with the blood of Jesus and begin to pray a hedge of protection around them because we're sending them off to these war zones we call public school every day. Where they're being bullied and picked on and all the other stuff and because there's always somebody that is better or has more. And they're dealing with all of these issues every day. I would not want to be a teenager today. But we have this attitude, you know, if, if it doesn't work, you know, just get rid of it or, or, or you know, just. But there's a sacredness of fighting for your family. You don't check out. You fight for it. We need to start covering our families and our children. We need to start bringing them to the family and the altar of God. Look, if our son or our daughter is lost, we need to get on our knees and begin to pray heaven down. Why? Because one day heaven will come down, and if they're not ready, they won't go. And that's a tough reality, but we've got to sometimes get woken up ourselves so that we know that what we're fighting against is life and death and eternity. And we've got to pray and believe. But God can save those which are lost and he answers prayer. But there's a sacredness. We need to rebuild that. We need men to start acting like men and women to start acting like women. And we need to start respecting one another. Everybody's trying to redefine what the family is and try to redefine roles and try to redefine households. But the bottom line is, is God set the standard. And we need to base our families and our lives on that standard. God set the rules. And there's a sacredness of family. There's walls that need to be rebuilt in our society, and we need a Nehemiah to step up and say, you know what, Lord, use me. I'm tired of watching the enemy do this. I'm tired of watching everything fall apart around me. I'm tired of it. And, Lord, I'm going to pray. I'm going to believe. I'm going to stand. I'm going to stand when I need to stand, and I'm going to be quiet when I need to be quiet. But, Lord, I'm not going to be passive anymore. I'm going to fight I'm going to take the sword and I'm going to pray and I'm going to drive the enemy out of my mind, out of my home, out of my life, away from my family, away from my children. And I'm going to claim them for you. And I'm going to war and I'm going to war and I'm going to do war until I see it move. And I'm going to see in the spiritual what I want to happen in the natural. It's time that we fight. It's time that we do warfare. Our children are worth the fight. Our liberty is worth the fight. Our country is worth the fight. This community is worth the fight. Your family's worth the fight. We need some Nehemiahs that look out and see the walls burning. And it has to do something more inside of us than just get this glimpse of, oh, that's sad. How many people, how many teenagers this year in our own community killed themselves? That should bring the church to an awareness that something's wrong. We need to fight. 
Somebody's got to be Nehemiah and grab a hold of it. So I want you to bow your heads with me this morning. 